Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Charles again, and this is our fifth session of The Space Between Stories. And um, the title of today's session is Acting from the Subtle. And I'm going to introduce that um, in a minute here um, in a little bit more detail. I'm just suppressing my urge to start talking about it now, but I'm going to wait um, and hand it over to Raven uh, to just, um, for those of you who may have missed a few sessions, just for a very quick uh, tech um, tour. Uh, so, Raven. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who have joined us before, you may kind of already know where things are, but just a quick overview. Um, you should be seeing Charles and I to the right of your screen under a panel that says participants. If you click the button in the top right-hand corner of that video, you will be taken to a full screen video. And that's probably the best way for you to view um, for the duration of the session. If you do that now, then I'll walk you through some of the menu options that you'll see there. So if you click the video to the right of your screen, in the top right-hand corner, there's a button. It's either going to be three people or an arrow. If you click that, then you'll be on full screen. And once you're there, you'll see a green tab at the top of the screen. This is how you can um, kind of you can chat there with everyone who's here in the session. So just click on chat, and a box will open up. You can also click on the participant box, and that'll open up for you. Um, at the bottom of that participant screen is an option for feedback. So you have buttons there to be able to say yes or no, applause, um, you know, if we're speaking too fast or too slowly, um, all of those things are there. So your menu options are on that, in that green tab. If you just hover over it, you'll see a menu appear there. And if you have any questions, uh, any technical questions throughout the duration of the session, you can feel free to send a private chat message to either myself or you'll see um, a listing for WebEx producer. That's Kahani, and she's here to help us throughout the session. So at the bottom of that, um, your chat box, you'll see a place where it says send to. And rather than sending that to all participants or to all attendees, you can select one of our names, either myself, Raven, or WebEx producer, Tahani, and we'll be able to help you out. I think that's it. Back to you, Joel. All right. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, yeah, so uh, acting from the subtle. Um, you know, one of the last, last week we had Bio as our guest, and he talked a lot about um, embracing the unknowing, about slowing down, about stillness, about, about um, the necessity sometimes to stumble, to not know, to find, in order to find the hidden treasure, in order to encounter what had been outside of your understanding. And, and sometimes, um, and, and he quoted the African proverb, uh, the times are urgent, we must slow down. And that can be very triggering for people who would say, no, 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 the times are urgent, we must speed up. You know, we must, we must roll up our sleeves and take on these problems and bang our heads together. Cynthia and I were talking on the phone a couple of days ago and she was describing kind of like this um, conventional paradigm of activism, which is like, you know, uh, goading ourselves into action. We've got to do something. And so people get triggered though, when they are like, well, okay, I mean, but look at the terrible things that are happening on this planet, Charles. I mean, are you saying not to do anything about that? You know, um, we, have our, we have our ability to act, you know, we're supposed to do something about it. But we're not actually, no one's actually saying not to do anything about it. What we're saying is that our, very often, our habits of action, uh, the ways that we are accustomed to doing things, might even be part of the problem. And this is true not only on the kind of activist social political level, but also on an interpersonal level. You may have um, this experience, you know, of, of someone in your life and you're arguing and arguing, and you're in the same kind of loop all the time. Uh, so we're talking actually, one thing maybe we're talking about is more effective action. 
that, and it's not just being smarter. It's not just coming up with a better strategy. It goes deeper than that. It's um, really listening to more subtle guiding. Um, and sometimes that guidance doesn't make sense to our rational minds that are steeped in the logic of separation, steeped in the logic of, of creating change through force. So our guest today, um, Cynthia Jures, actually I'm gonna introduce her a little bit more uh, in a minute because first I wanna introduce um, Brick Dubois, who is a musician and maybe, um, Brick, maybe you wanna just, uh, do you wanna come on the mic and, and um, Brick composed a song while he was reading In More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know It's Possible. And he's gonna play it for us uh, live, but maybe Brick, do you wanna come on and just um, introduce yourself a little and, and where, where are you from? Where are you, where are you living right now? Gotta unmute you here. Hi, Charles. Um, I'm from Antwerp in Belgium and uh, I'm a singer songwriter amongst other things. Uh, when I'm on stage, I call myself Floatstone, which is just a pun on my name because Brick is a stone and Dubois is French for made of wood. Mm. And um, I'd like to play this song. It's called Skipping Over Damaged Area. And it's a song inspired by uh, reading The More Beautiful World and also inspired by the idea of, basically, it's a song that tries to describe how I feel when I can give. Um, I got involved in uh, what you would translate it, you would call share squares, uh, which are organized over here in my part of the country, where people come together and they share stuff that they don't need, good stuff that people can use. And anybody who wants to take it home can take it home. And a lot of the times people kind of concentrate more on who's getting, who's getting that. And to me, the essence of a thing like that is actually how it makes people feel when they can give. So that's what the inspiration to this song. So, you want me to play it? Yes, please. Okay, okay here it goes. Projected from a fountain, I see consequence upon consequence. I flee nothing less than senseless pain. You want to know what you need to live? All you got to do is learn how to give, and trust everything will follow from that. It takes to be 
Like a drop projected from a fountain I see Consequence upon consequence I see Nothing less than senselessness You wanna know what you need to lay That's it. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. So, in your, uh, you, I get, you sent me a little bio here. Yeah. Um, you're you're uh, playing music, you're doing permaculture. Yeah. Um, involved in gift economy. Mm -hmm. um, how are all those things linked for you? Um, they're linked to a feeling, actually. Um, I'm also a teacher. Uh, I like to connect to people. And uh, I was lucky enough to read The Ascent of Humanity and uh, really realize how deeply this connection exists. And uh, making music, uh, teaching, getting deeply into contact with nature through permaculture and doing things because of the feeling um, is very worthwhile to me. And I think that's a big link in, in everything I do, I try to do in life. Basically, what I did was at one point, I stopped doing things for the money that I got for it, or I still get for it, actually. Not that I'm doing all sorts of different things than, than before, but uh, changing where I start from, starting more from within has changed the experience and I enjoy myself a lot more. Uh -huh. So the money becomes more of a side effect than the driving yes, purpose. Yes, that, yes, that's true. That's yeah. true. I uh, started living with less money uh, and I don't really miss it because I'm, I'm rich in experience. Actually, what I do is I uh, um, don't believe in Mondays. Uh, you wrote somewhere that, you know, why is it that people hate Mondays? And, yeah, uh, but why do you think people yeah, Mondays? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and I stopped living that way. So uh, I, I do things. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was an interesting discussion on the forum of, uh, about the question, um, what do you do? When people ask, what do you do? What do you answer then? And uh, I would say I enjoy myself. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And and so thank you, Brick. I mean, we're uh, I'm going to kind of use that to lead into uh, introducing Cynthia. OK, that's fine. Because, um, you know, ordinarily when someone asks, what do you do? Uh, a valid answer is what do you do for money? But yeah. you could also um, in some counterculture, you could say another valid answer is what are you doing to change the world? Mm. And so both of these answers are kind of dependent on some external standard of value. Mm. But what about the answer, I just enjoy myself? Like that, you know, right, left, and center, that uh, is not an acceptable answer. Very often yeah. it isn't. No, yeah. that's true. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And, and so the unacceptability of that answer comes from I hope, to, I hope I'm not sounding like a broken record, but it comes from our story of self that says that your fundamental nature is selfish because after all, you're a separate being in a world of yeah. other. And so you're fundamentally, if you're going to just enjoy yourself, well, that's going to come at the expense of other people. It's not going to contribute uh, to the well-being of others because in order to be a good person, you have to overcome just enjoying yourself. I mean, that's just... It's almost an insult. Oh, what have you been doing all day? Just enjoying yourself? You know? So I think that, um, and for me, it's always been a little scary to uh, do things just because I want to. But sometimes, and this, but then when I, when I take that route, I find that what I want begins to change. And I learned that what I thought I wanted, I really didn't necessarily want. And I begin to do things that just didn't make sense in the world that I've been living in. So I'm going to uh, 
um, talk a little bit about Cynthia Jewers now, who's, who's been, we've been friends for a number of years now. Um, geez, must be like five and five years maybe. Um, and Cynthia has spent decades doing something that at first, at least, might have seemed quite insane from any perspective, from a money-making perspective, or even from I'm going to make a big change in the world perspective. Um, so Cynthia, probably most of you have received her bio or maybe even watched her video. She's um, a, I guess you would say a Buddhist teacher. Um, I'm not even sure if Cynthia would quite identify herself that way. After all, the Dalai Lama says we don't need more Buddhists. We need more people practicing Buddhism, but not more Buddhists. Um, so, Cynthia, why don't you just come on and, and uh, say hi to us? There we go. Can you hear me, Charles? Yes, I can. Hi. Hi, Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and uh, and be with you to join this conversation, which is so vital and so important. Um, and yeah, I, I'm a Buddhist teacher, but um, more and more, or I should say less and less identified with, with uh, the Buddhism part. Um, you said the Dalai Lama, something about the Dalai Lama. I think the Dalai Lama also said the world uh, will be will be enhanced greatly by Western women getting involved in change. So maybe I'm just one mm -hmm. of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, where would you like to start, Charles? Um, well, um, you know, I think a lot of people, so there's a couple of themes that are coming up um, for us, and we'll get into some more in the questions. One of them is about loneliness. But another thing that's been coming up again and again is essentially the question, what do I do? Or, you know, coming out of an old story in the space between stories, like, what do I do? And how do I make the choice of what to do? And, and, and where can I find the support to listen to the promptings that I'm getting that don't make sense in the world that we're graduating from? So maybe if you could just tell, um, if you don't mind, the, the story of how you began, like, maybe not even everyone on the call knows what you do exactly, but but so like the, the story about the Earth Treasure Files project and how that began, um, so that we can feel a little more confident being crazy ourselves. Great, I'm I'm uh, encountering a little technical difficulty. It says I'm no longer connected to the event, but it's automatically reconnecting. Can you still hear my voice? Yes, I can hear your voice. Okay, so, um, so I'm not seeing anyone. Um, hopefully, that will just automatically reconnect, which would be lovely. Um, yeah. But yeah, so just to kind of go back for a minute, um, what happened to me about 25 years ago was that I had the opportunity to meet an old wise man in a cave, <laughs> literally a uh, 106-year-old Tibetan Lama who lived in a cave way up high in the Himalayas. And um, I was invited to walk up those mountains to meet him and gosh i i really realized as i was walking up the mountain that um i had a unique opportunity to ask a question of the old wise man in the cave and so i thought about what that question might be and what came to me very strongly was to ask him what can we do to bring healing and protection to the earth and even as i'm saying this to you i've I feel the emotion of, of that question alive in me still. And it has been a question that has guided my life. Um, although it took me many years to realize that I was living out that question. But he and I, I spent time with him and he, um, he told me many things, but uh, he said to me, you need to get these earth treasure vases and you need to fill them with prayers and offerings and put them in the ground, and they will do that work of bringing healing and protection to the earth. 
Well, my rational mind was going, yeah, right, how's a little clay pot filled with prayers going to alleviate suffering or uh, transform the radioactive waste that is being pumped into the watershed where I live in New Mexico across the valley from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And yet the other part of me said, okay, where do I get them? Because, of course, the change that we're seeking is um, going to come in many different ways. And um, we have to do everything we possibly can. So and hang on, I'm just uh, wondering if I might move my location because I seem to be having trouble staying on the um, internet. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to move if, if that's okay. Or am I coming back yeah. on? Maybe I am. Yeah, I'm coming back on. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, so um, No, I think we've lost Cynthia. Um, okay, we've lost Cynthia temporarily. Um, so reality in shooting here, I'm going to to just text her. Um, um, and um, sorry about that. However, it's okay because I have a ton to say already um, about what she was saying. Just say, uh, oh, bummer. are you back, Cynthia? No? Uh, I'm here. Okay, can we, we you lost me? you temporarily. Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, and I was just trying to cover because we lost you temporarily, but um, where, where did we lose each other? Let me let me actually just comment on what you said already a little bit, and then okay. and then you can continue because one thing that is really striking me, like for one thing, like meeting a 106 year old llama in a cave, like I mean, come on, that's like kind of cliche almost, right? It's like this this like legend come to life, you know what I mean? Like that doesn't like we hear stories about that, but that doesn't actually happen, does it? But it did. So why? My first question is why did that happen? And I know the answer. I know the answer. It just popped into my head, uh, which is that that you held that question. That that experience was attracted to the question that you said you had been carrying your whole life. How can I bring? Can you say it again, actually, for us? How can we bring healing and protection to the earth? What can we do to bring healing yes. and protection to the earth? Yeah, and I want to actually bless that question with half a minute of silence. How can we bring healing and protection to the earth? Because isn't that why we are all here on this call fundamentally? Because we have that desire and we don't know how to do it. All of the old answers of here's how to create change in the world have fallen short. We don't know how to do it. But what if we could trust the power of that sincere question? to bring answers to us, to bring directions to us, maybe not answers, but directions that are beyond what we could have imagined. What if we don't have to figure it out, but we just need to trust something and we call that guidance forth through the sincerity of our question and maybe the answer doesn't make sense. And you were telling us, Cynthia, how this answer didn't make sense. Like, how is this going to stop radioactive waste? You know, how is this going to bring peace to the Congo, et cetera, et cetera? So, so yeah, tell us the next step of the story. <laughs> well, um, 
so I had those questions, uh, those coming from my rational mind, but I also had um, a deep yearning in my heart to uh, to engage somehow. And I also have a great deal of love and respect for the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and um, and shamanic and and indigenous cultures everywhere. Um, and so prayer and ceremony has always been something I uh, enjoyed. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, you know, this is what's been given to me. Um, and actually, it took me five years probably before I really took up the practice, maybe longer. It took me a while because I felt like I should have had more teachings. I should have been told more what to do. I didn't really know what, how, well, what are we supposed to do with these little pots, you know? And what they told me, what the Lama told me was just put them in the ground. They'll do the work. And so, again, my, my rational mind was kind of blown away. I had no, nothing to hold on to. Um, <laughs> and so slowly, slowly, you know, with, with droughts and fires and all kinds of issues in the world that were making themselves more strongly known and felt, um, I realized that we had these little pots and that we, we could pull them out and start working with them. So um, that is what I did, and um, as I say, slowly, slowly, um, this began to unfold, and it was really a process of, of getting myself out of the way and apprenticing to the vessels themselves, these little clay pots, and gathering people every full moon to make offerings and express uh, our prayers, um, dedicating one by one to going into a different part of the world. And as time passed, uh, those places became more and more intense, um, especially in Africa. Um, but each place called forth a different prayer and a different way of engaging. And I was very surprised at how this practice was um, uh, that people all over the world, no matter what the tradition they, they come from or the, the background, the, that, that people responded to this in, in a very similar way. They mm -hmm. opened their hearts. They poured out what they care most about. And they made offerings that were meaningful to them from wherever they are. And then those little, those little pots filled with all of that life force, you might say, were planted in the earth somewhere. And, and that whole process, including the planting and the, the burying of these prayers, um, required us to get out of the way, in a sense. We have, our, we have what we want to see happen. We think we know what should happen. But actually, what we're doing in this, in this way is to create the conditions for what, what is, I don't even have the words for it, what is naturally arising out of that land or those those communities, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah. This has come up a few other times, too. Um, earlier on, um, I told the story of this Australian activist who, you know, they had uh, they'd given up. Basically, the police were going to invade their encampment and everything. They said, well, we're just going to have a celebration instead of, you know, clashing. And, and anyway, the, 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 he said, it, when he wrote me about this, and he said um, that if we're attached to a specific result, then we will lose every time. But if we are not attached, we cannot be defeated. Um, and that doesn't mean not caring about a specific result. 
but it means um, being open to something even greater happening, to being open to, um, to, to the injustice or the destruction being part of a larger process. You know, like, like in California, like, you know, should we be praying for the drought to end? Well, maybe a severe drought is just what has to happen for people to awaken to, you know, how we're abusing the land. You know, we don't know. Um, so, but nonetheless, you know, I can hear the, uh, the cynic present here. Um, saying, well, Cynthia, that's all very nice. I'm glad that everybody poured forth their their true prayers and desires and put a pot in the earth. But, I mean, you know, like in some of the places you work, terrible things are happening. There, there, there are, you know, like, like mass uh, brutal rapes of women, you know, in Congo, you know, there's, 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 you know, I mean, you've been to places where there's been genocide, you know, where there's been horrible things happening. And here you are burying pots and everyone's feeling all nice and huggy, touchy-feely, but shouldn't you be there exposing? Shouldn't you be there fighting for justice? You know, like, is anything tangible happening? Like, that's what the skeptic says. And the skeptic thinks that, that because you're not exercising force, nothing tangible could be happening. And maybe you're just kind of uh, indulging in some kind of spiritual escapism. So... Would you like to debunk that for us? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. I wish you could see my face. I don't think I'm on video, um, which no. is too bad. Or, I, I, anyway, I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like um, that uh, attitude is, well, of course, it is very much a part of the old story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in fact, for me, the process of starting with my deepest prayer is a way of engaging the powers that be in the deepest way. And from there, tangible things happen that you would be so amazed by. Yeah, amaze us. I love that. Okay, so just back up for a second, because when you, when you operate from the mind that you just described, you've mm -hmm. got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. And you think you have all the answers. Yep. And it's very predictable. And that has basically not gotten us very far. I mean, at least we think that. <laughs> we've, we've arrived at a dead end. And it's so, hopeless. And it's hopeless. And we're isolated and all of those things. So as someone said in the forum, uh, that quote from Albert Einstein, you can't get there from here, however he said that. So let's do it a different way. And let's go to our deepest caring, our heart of hearts. And connect with our 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 our, our uh, intention you i call prayer intention uh it's the same and from there uh when especially when we join with others who also have intentions or prayers care very deeply and if you go into countries like congo or liberia where I've worked very deeply, um, everyone it really cares very strongly about peace. They have suffered tremendously. And hmm. so inviting, creating an opening to invite that deep caring to be expressed and shared builds an energy. You don't know where it's going, mm -hmm. but you can trust it because of its purity. 
And and then you get out of the way and you watch what happens when you, in this case, you, watch what happens. you bury these these prayers in in a little clay pot and and let let them be watered. But in the course of that, you've also each person in that community has connected with something very deeply important to them, and they are not the same. Mm-hmm. And so, out of that, actions come that are of a different order. And I've seen this time and again. For example, um, you know the story of Christian Bethelson, who is a Mm -hmm. former rebel uh, general in the Liberian uh, Civil War. He was was known as General Leopard. Um, He commanded 30,000 troops at one time and, and child soldiers and all the rest. Bethelson was out of work when the war ended, like many of his uh, fellow combatants, um, had no idea what else to do with his life, couldn't put food on the table, um, was shunned, um, was on his way to the Ivory Coast to offer his services as a um, mercenary, and his car got stuck in the mud interesting. He encountered a group called the Everyday Gandhis who invited him to become a peace builder right then and there. And they hugged him and told him that they wanted him to join them. And he said, okay. I guess he had nothing else to lose. But there was also that calling in him. So I met him through the Everyday Gandhis. And when he saw me meditate, he asked me to teach him how to meditate. And I thought he was crazy. I couldn't imagine that he was really serious, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. And Bethelson learned how to meditate. He he participated with the Earth Treasure Vase ceremony in Liberia. We buried that vase in that soil. After the vase went in the ground, the community said, now what? We want to remember our prayers for peace. This is really important. And Bethelson had the idea to build a a peace hut in in the place where the, the vase had been buried which is a round, open-walled structure where people go to resolve conflict and, and, and pray together, be together. And so they, they built a peace hut there. And now we have uh, three, almost four peace huts in Liberia in different regions where there is a lot of conflict still. Bethelson has gone on to um, uh, study meditation um, with me and with Thich Nhat Hanh. And he has be found his voice in fighting Ebola recently, he realized that in order to uh, stop Ebola, you have to have mindfulness. And mindfulness has become sort of the mainstay of, of his work to build peace and heal that, that country and that culture. So, you know, n- he's becoming a voice for the whole uh, nation, actually, on the radio with a whole co- um, radio program called Conversations Under the Peace Hut. I could go on and on, but there's an example of a very tangible uh, outcome of taking a little clay pot, filling it with prayers, and burying it in the earth. Yes, and and when you did that, when you buried that clay pot in the earth, you didn't condition that on knowing that tangible outcomes would arise. Correct. Because a lot of us are in a place in our lives where we are, are similarly to you, we're called to do things that our, um, our received understanding of cause and effect tells us that this isn't going to make a very big difference in the world. But like you were saying, our received understanding of cause and effect has led us to a terrible dead end and tells us that our salvation is impossible. You can very rationally, you know, any time someone, you've probably had these conversations, maybe um, we've all been on both sides of the conversation where the, the hopeful person is describing, you know, how that there is hope for the planet and how this problem could be solved and how peace could, could happen here and there. And then the more rational person and the more realistic person will obliterate that hope 
And the more rational, realistic person is right according to what we've received as practical and possible and the way the world works. Right. Therefore, therefore, we have to be standing in another place in order to access a much larger conception of cause and effect and to listen to those promptings that, that are not conditioned on our rational understanding of, of how things can work out. And I think everybody is in a place like this in one form or another. And, and maybe like some ways even more extreme than you, like at least you're, you know, going somewhere where there's strife, you know, but like what about the person who's calling is very, very small and very local and humble and invisible. Mm. Uh, it might even be harder for them. I'm thinking of a, uh, of a, of the preschool teacher, Stella, um, my wife takes Carrie to moms and me where there's this, it's at a local Waldorf school and there's, the teacher is Miss Jackie, and Stella describes just like how gracefully she imparts nonviolent parenting skills to everybody there, just through example, you know, through the way that she looks at the children, you know, through the, the way that she speaks. Um, and, and who knows, you know, what effect this will have on the world. If, uh, a cynical person might say, yeah, you know, so what if some privileged white children are getting it, right? Um, and, and then Ms. Jackie also takes care of a, she, she's adopted a severely handicapped girl and is raising her as her daughter. And, and, you know, who knows, again, what threads of causality she's tugging by doing that, how those will affect reality in a generation or a thousand years. Right, Charles. I, I want to say something about that, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, after all these years of doing what I've done, especially because it's so in direct relationship with the earth, I really have come to see, and I, I'm sure you and many others join me in this, that we are each a part of the whole. and this web of life that we are each a part of is very precious and we each have a, a role to play and that is the great opportunity of these times to uh, play our part to offer the gift that is only ours to offer and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's big or small it's it is what it is and the the the, the great opportunity is to Find that and trust that and, and, and give it because then when we give it, we are participating in, in, in life. And that's what, if I may be so bold, I feel Mother Earth is asking of us, yes, mm -hmm. each of us now. And so that woman who is the school teacher is offering an incredible gift that is just hers to offer, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's making such a difference to the lives of the people that she encounters. And it's, it's actually my own feeling that as she does that, it's also benefiting the earth herself in some fundamental way that we can't explain, that we, we um, can't even maybe see or recognize with the same old um, methods you know, but it is what is being called forth from us um, that is what uh, the earth and, and all life is, is um, inviting us to, to bring forth. So this to me is, is, is part of this collective awakening that I feel like we're, we're in the midst of. Um, and I made a decision a, quite a long time ago not to really relate to or identify with that old, the, all those old voices. Of course, I still get caught by them many, many times. And in fact, just this year, it was so interesting. On December 31st, as we were about to enter the new year, my back went out and I literally couldn't move. And I couldn't enter the new year in the same old way. I couldn't take another step into the same into the new year in the same old way 
because there was a way in which I was I was overriding my 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 body because this work and this practice is so compelling and there's so much to do and the need is so great um, that I was caught in um, sacrificing myself mm-hmm. for that that is calling me. So I know many of us get get caught in different ways, um, but the more we can stop, take a breath, <laughs> and allow ourselves to connect with that deep calling that is sometimes kind of hard to hear, but is there in our hearts. In the space in between the stories, that was something that came to me as I was preparing for this, is the the, the words, the space in between mm-hmm. the story. I want to focus on the space because it's in that space that something different can happen. And if we go too fast, or if we cover it up with our great ideas, or if we, you know, just do, 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 we miss that space. And in that space is where magic can happen. In that space is where something new can take place. For me, on just January 1st, I had to stop. I had to go to bed. I had to really take a lot of deep breaths. And and then something new began to emerge for me. Mm-hmm. And even after 25 years of, of all of this, um, I felt as if I had gotten to a place where I couldn't go on in the same old way. And um, I run a nonprofit organization called Alliance for the Earth. And I was I was aware of how that, even just running a, an organization, is putting me into, in spite of what the great mission is, it's putting mm-hmm. me into a context that is um, out, outdated, it's run its course, it's not going anywhere. So that has to stop. So it's in that space that something new can happen. And I would counsel all of us to, um, uh, to not rush too quickly to a new story, but just mm-hmm. to rest in the space in between and have that be the place that we live our lives from. Yeah. I like to 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 say to to trust that that space has its own wisdom and rhythm and pace. Because we're so and that un- from that from that place we can begin to access our own gifts the calling that is uniquely mine or yours or someone else's. Everyone listening has that, has that special gift. Or the the thing that gets you up in the middle of the night, as Andrew Harvey might say, you know, that that you care so much about. Um, What is that? Because that's something that becomes the anchor for your life. For me, it was the question, what can I do to bring healing and protection to the earth? Yeah, and and none of the urgency of, I've got to find that thing, I've got to find that thing, was really what brought it to you. It was the purity of the question itself. It wasn't the, you know what I'm saying? I do. Like it came, the answer came to you in a form that you could not possibly have contrived. If you had said, okay, I'm going to, you know, survey the planet for wise llamas and caves, and I'm going to visit each one of them, you know, and I'm going to make a plan to do that. And by the end of next year, I'm going to have visited 13 caves. Like, you wouldn't have gotten it that way. No. And I never, ever would have imagined little clay pots either. So, yeah. um, you know, and now I live with these little clay pots, and, uh, you know, they become living beings. But, but that's just my thing. <laughs> It's taught right. me a lot, though. It's taught me about being a vessel because it's, it's, um, it's actually not, in the end, about doing this practice. It's about being, being a vessel for peace, 
for uh, healing, for love. So I think, um, you know, we're, we're, this whole conversation has been kind of um, circling the idea of prayer. Mm-hmm. And I think I, there's one of the questions that was, that we have, uh, that was sent in is about prayer. And I think, Cynthia, maybe now's a good time to, to bring that person on to, uh, to um, ask about that. Um, this was... Um, We have a couple of questions more on kind of loneliness and reconnecting, and then we have the questions yeah. were great. I read yeah. all of them, and they were just stunning, and they all seem to fit together in such a beautiful way. Yeah, and there, I think I'd like to. Um, I don't know. It just has, somehow it seems seems relevant right now. I can't find the word prayer in it now, but um, I'd like to bring our Arjuna on um, uh, to just um, Arjuna sent a beautiful. I'm not sure if I called a question, but um, if you Arjuna, if you do have a question or just uh, something you want to say from the from the energy of what you sent in, doesn't have to be verbatim the same or anything, but but let's. Uh, Bring it into the field for Cynthia and I, and for the for the everybody here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for everything you said so far. It's definitely uh, resonated a lot with me, and I think you know, I think especially after listening to what uh, you guys are talking about, what's really coming up for me right now with this sense of wanting to bow deeper into service or to find one's gifts and to live life as a sort of offering of that gift or an offering of that prayer. I think it's something that resonates so much with me, but um, it's when it, when, when it resonates, what I really feel there is this sort of deep sort of sadness. You know, when I, I'm, you know, feeling at peace right now, but then I, as I bring the rest of my life into my mind, or even if I look out my window and feel what it's like to live on the suburban street and see, you know, my neighbors who are strangers, what I feel is how, almost like how, there's this question of how can I return? And underneath that, there's just this deep longing of wanting to return, and that's all that's there. There's no sense of this is the right way, that's the right way. And it's, I don't know. I think I, I really liked um, this idea that of prayer being able to offer those intentions itself as being the foundation of living our life is really attractive to me. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering when that sadness does come up, is that itself, that itself feels like a prayer to me. Hmm. Can I respond to that? Are you finished? Or yeah. would, would you like to keep going, Arjuna? Uh, no, that's, yeah. Because I'm really moved, it, uh, moved by what you're saying, and um, I think that sadness is such a, fundamental part of feeling deeply you know and maybe the space in between the stories is a bit of feeling both the suffering and the joy at the same time you know if we can if we can be in a place where we can allow both to coexist within our hearts and minds um, we're fully alive and I feel like the, you know, I didn't even know how to pray at all. I, I wasn't brought up in the church, so I don't. I, I've had to learn all of this. And <laughs> um, when I talk about prayer, I really mean living from a place of caring, and then my life becomes a prayer. Each step is holy. 
and if I continue and you know continually come back to that over and over again and cultivate that perspective in my life, then what I do has meaning and and i I feel that it makes a difference, even if it's some small thing that you can't even see right away. I'm also hearing um, like this longing um, this you know sitting in suburbia you know and and a longing for the for the peace, for the beauty, for the for the for the reconnection, um, for what's possible, and the full experience of longing, I think, is valuable too. Uh, like sadness, you know, like grief, like like all these other things. Like to be okay, and for me, this has been a huge thing to to be okay with the longing, and not to jump away from it into kind of like fantastical solutions or into despair, you know, um, and to be comfortable with just the, the wanting. Um, and then it becomes like that truth. It's like um, Lissa said in the earlier session, um, um, to come to peace with what's true for you. And so to come to peace, you know, when I read like, I was just reading this article in the New Yorker, horrific, you know, about the, about ch child immigrants, undocumented immigrants, you know, and the kidnappers that prey on them and their destitute families getting extorted. And then, then they get rescued by the government, which can even be worse, you know, and like this whole thing and this whole wrongness, just like, and I'm just like, you know, after thousands of years of philosophy and law and civilization, can't we do better than this? You know, can't we do better than this? And wanting it so badly to be different and trusting that wanting that when I incorporate all of these wantings and all of the sadness, that it changes me. Being in that changes me into somebody who takes different actions. Being in the Earth Treasure of Oz ceremony changes Christian Bethelson into somebody who is a different person, says different words, thinks different thoughts. Is that like what you mean by prayer, Cynthia? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we often run away from that because it's very intense. Yeah. You know, I feel that um, living in this way, which is not so much the sleeves rolled up, you know, pounding the pavement kind of activism, but this more subtle, sacred activism, is um, actually takes more courage because we're we're facing ourselves and our deepest yearnings um, and the suffering that's out there in a way that um, it's easier sometimes to run away from and just pound the pavement, you know, beat up on somebody or um, whatever form that it takes. And, and I'm not saying that, that there's not a place for that kind of activism. Um, but we're, we're talking about transforming ourselves and the world. And so um, this, takes, this takes great courage. And it also takes um, community which is another thing that came up in some of the questions. Um, mm -hmm. And also your conversation with Bio um, last time, which had to do with how do we find each other. Um, this kind of, of, of change, whether it's personal or collective, is, is very, very hard to do alone. And we really, really do need to come together. And I, and I feel Thich Nhat Hanh is so right. The next Buddha will be a Sangha, meaning a community. It's not some lone, you know, enlightened master up there in the cave. It's, it's you and me together. And something happens in that space in between us 
that has that is new on the planet. And so anyway, we have to find each other, and we have to do this together. And um, so it's one thing to find our deep yearning, our calling, our our prayer in the middle of the dark night. It's another thing to um, invite a community around those deepest yearnings. Yeah, let's move on to that now. We have uh, two. two. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Phil Perry and Adriana Peterson to, to share now, maybe just one after the other, because um, these are really, really beautiful, um, sincere questions. So, um, Phil, do you want to go first? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was very touched by what Bio said last week about depression. And when someone uh, is feeling sad or lonely or experiences a loss, then the tribe gets together and they collectively help. They all gather around and their collective energy soothes and comforts that person, and the depression or the sadness, the grief, it lightens. It may not go away totally forever, but it's much, much better, and the tribe is there to hold that person. Now, my comment is that it's wonderful if you have a tribe like that, if you're lucky enough to belong to a family or a community where everyone is loving and sweet, then yes, wouldn't it be wonderful? However, in my personal experience, Charles and everyone, you know, I don't have that. I don't have a tribe of loving folks. So I kind of shuffle along, you know, through life. I feel sad mad, bad sometimes, and have to work it out all on my own. And there's so many techniques, and I'm so sick of techniques, Charles. I, I just want to scream. I, I, yes. I, if I journal one more page, I, I must have 12 gigantic three-inch three, three inch thick binders of journals up in my closet. Where has that gotten me? How has that helped me? I'm here to say that, yeah, it might have been kind of fun while I was journaling, but no, I'm in the same old, same old place, and um, I feel even lonelier, more isolated and alone. And I just want to say one more thing before you comment. Um, the only beings who are closest to me, who really, really love and care about me, and I feel it down to my bones, are my pets. And if I didn't have my pets, I, I don't even know where I'd be. But that's helpful to hold them, to kiss them, to have them put their little paws on me. And I have a pony and he like rubs his great big head against me. I, that helps. That helps. All those journals. I'm sorry. It, it really, <laughs> it really, you know, it really hasn't done much. So yeah. Yeah. I'll start off with that, and then I have other examples if you'd like to hear them. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, I think before, actually, I was going to go straight to Adriana, but I do want to comment just kind of on the, can you mute yourself, actually, Phil? Hit the mute button. Thanks. Because um, we're getting some feedback. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Like I, I wanted to tell like everybody that that what you're saying is one of the reasons why this course doesn't offer you know after every class a three step process or a five step process you know to to you know um, move into your heart or to do this or to do that like those things are in oversupply already you know that's that's the, the self help um, world and you know. What they almost all have in common is that they are something you do alone. And they're well contained because of that. Now, this isn't, I'm not, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. 
and um, Cynthia, do you want to comment on this one, or should we wait for the second one and comment on the loneliness thing? Um, we can move on and, and listen okay. to the next um, offering and then open yeah. it up. Oh, so, yeah. Okay, so um, next prayer is coming from Adriana. Hi, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes, we yep. can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I was listening to Cynthia just now saying how important community is. And that really makes me cry because the problems we have right now is, is basically that. Uh, the, the sense of separation has been reinforced by the old story for 15 years. And I am in a place where everything is falling apart. We are about to, uh, sorry about that, uh, run out of food. We have no medicine in hospitals. I have a student that is looking for a knee replacement for his wife, and he can't find it. A woman here that have breast cancer are having mastectomies because there's no chemo. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And when you talk about people and you tell them the only way to fix this is to work together. They look at me like I am some kind of wacko who came from another planet. Like, that's not possible. Do you know what you're talking about? Do you know what country you're in? And I see my friends. I have students that have, been, have moved away from the country and move out. I have six in the last six months, and my friends are just trying either to pack their belongings and, and move out of the country, or they're getting their weapons ready to fight. And I'm just sitting in the middle, and I don't know what to do. I, I know that we need to get together. I know this story about separation. I know the space in between. But this is scary, and it's very lonely, because I look around, there's nobody there. They don't understand that it's something called community, and that you need to work together. And, and it's been reinforced like over and over and over on the TV, on the radio, radio, your, your, the other citizen is your enemy. And I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. I really don't know. I'm sorry. Adriana, where, where, are, you, where are you calling us from? Venezuela. Caracas, Venezuela. Venezuela. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I was so composed and I was talking. No, you're, you're, this, your prayers it, it, are the, welcome. The conversation was pretty, but when she said something about community, where do I find that community? I have friends and I don't feel lonely. I am blessed because I have people around that care, that understand. But when, when I try to go deeper and I talk to my students and I talk to they just look at me and have this weird face, like, what are you talking about? That doesn't exist. That's not possible. I go, Jesus Christ, what else do I do? I, I really don't know. Sorry about that. If you can just comment about it. I, I, there's too many things I could talk about, but I don't think I can right now. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, Cynthia, do you have? You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. And let's actually, before we, before we respond, let's um, give that beautiful sharing half a minute of silence. And just being with that, that I don't know what to do. The longing and the despair, the sadness.
Hmm. Cynthia, do you have a? Yeah, I I'd really love to speak with you, Adriana. I I read your comments um, earlier, and hearing you now again, um, I'm very glad to to hear you and to be with you. Um, when I read what you wrote, and again hearing you, I was struck by a comment that you made that there's a small group of you. Uh, maybe it's a, a, your group of friends. Um, and that's enough to start to build a sense of community. I think when you ha when there's so much despair and dysfunction, we get very overwhelmed, and that overwhelm uh, is very consuming. And so, even just this moment of silence that we share together um, is a refreshing is a way to refresh ourselves if we can really truly stop. When you said to have a moment of silence. It's not really silence if our mind keeps going on and on, or if our mo emotions continue to run. And it may take a while for them to settle down. But when we, when we, take, when we stop or, or, or take a breath, return to that silence, let's have it be really a refreshing uh, time out. And in order for that to happen, that means not, not thinking about the problem and not being consumed with the feeling of overwhelm or despair. And that's where we can support each other as friends to have that time out. When we can, when we can stop in that way, <clears throat> And it's much easier to do with, with, with others. Then slowly, slowly, some clarity begins to come about the situation that we find ourselves in that we couldn't see when we're so involved in, in the despair or in the problem. And that little glimpse is something that we, we need to uh, support and feed and cultivate. Um, because even if it's just two or three people, um, we have strength. We, we draw strength in our capacity to um, uh, see the way. I hope I'm making sense. I know it's hard, believe me. Um, my heart goes out to you, Adriana, in, in, in what you describe. Um, yeah. And I, did you want to say something? Um, I'm just saying thank you. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and I try. Some days I feel better. I think I have a small group of my students. I I use... Uh, Charles videos and, and readings and um, I did the Pachamama Alliance and I took I, I, some of those videos and, and I show them that there's a different way to do things. But then sometimes when I look at the news and and I, I talk to friends and I see how desperate they are, I get desperate again and I get upset because I feel that what I'm doing is nothing and I'm not solving anything. It's not nothing. It's it's not nothing. It feels like that. Sorry. Sometimes I know. It feels I know. Like that. It 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 feels like that because we're so conditioned to um, to it being a certain way. I, I don't know what the words are, Charles. You'll probably be able to to articulate this well. But even those few people. Even, even the small attempts that you have 
to do those things. That's enough to plant a seed. We plant a seed. It's a very small little seed. It takes water. It takes sun. It takes some fertilizer or compost to make it grow and make it grow strong. And you have to start with something very small sometimes. And, and discipline comes in with how much we allow ourselves to uh, watch the news, for example, or listen to those voices. If we can balance that, even in the face of the worst atrocities that are seeming overpowering, um, to take a little time out to yeah, water that I understand. Seed. Yeah. I understand. Sometimes it's just a feeling that, Jesus, I can't do this all by myself. That, that's how I feel it sometimes. I, I just, it's too much. And even if it's just five, six students, okay, I know I understand. They understand what I say. They look at me like, you're a very weird person. Why are you talking to us about this? And then they thank me because they have a different view of the world. But then you talk to another student and he's, he's crazy because his wife needs a knee replacement and he can't find it. Or you look at and, and you see how people are fighting for food because there's not enough. Then you go, oh my gosh, I'm not doing anything. All the problems are still there and they're getting worse and worse because nobody's is trying to fix them, and that's the truth. I mean, there, there are two battles here, one trying to deny it, the other one trying to, to, I don't know, I don't even know why. And I feel like, what's going on? It's, I, something needs to happen, and I can't do it. So, so Adriana, in the old story, nothing you can do is possibly enough. Therefore, the old story tells you, you might as well not do anything at all. <sighs> Yeah, it feels like that sometimes. That's right. So the old story is a poison. It is a poison. Don't eat that poison. Yeah. You're, what, what you're being invited to do here is to trust that God or the universe has put you in exactly the right spot for your gifts to operate. You don't have to know how how five or six, how this group of five or six people who trust you is going to help the, 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 you know, people fighting for food. I mean, going to help the, the rainforests that are being cut down. They're going to help. The, I mean, I mean, you know, you can expand this as large as you want. I mean, there's, there's horrific things happening all over this planet. You don't have to know. You just have to trust that you're being put in the right place and that, that everything that you do is important. You don't have to understand why it's important, but you can feel that it's important. You can feel it in those moments where you're having that connection, where you're, you know, it might just be, it might be because you're showing them videos, you're talking to them. It might be because you're doing some act of kindness or generosity. Um, and your, your desire right now, like outside of all of the, or inside maybe, all of the despair, all of the feeling of it's not enough. Your desire is really, I think, the same prayer that Cynthia carried in her life. Um, what can we do to heal and protect the planet? What can we do to heal and protect its people, our society, the people I care about? What, what, what can we do? That, that is enough. That prayer is enough because it will attract opportunities to you exactly and then and then we just we are able to respond um but i want to say two things too about this charles um and adriana and everyone um it's so important to ask for help and if there's no one around physically which Actually, that's a whole other part of the conversation, but you can mm -hmm. ask for help from the subtle realms as well. And this is now where I'm going to start sounding kind of weird, okay? But <laughs> um, uh, if you ask, they are there. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I think um, Adriana, we have a, uh, a a story here from Egypt, where at the time the story happened, things were maybe even worse than they are in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, it's called the Cake and the Revolution, and maybe we can invite. Um, uh, Leia Jean, Leia, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Um, is she on here? <laughs> yeah. Um, do you feel, Adriana, do you feel complete for now? Um, hey, Charles, can you hear me? Yeah. Who is it? Yes. Uh, um, I, I feel better. It, I, I understand what you is saying. I don't think it's weird. I that part I understand. It's just, sometimes it feels that's not enough, but I'm hoping I'll get to to the point where I can understand they're they're stronger than sometimes other people helping you around. But I'm working on it. I'm I'm doing my best to to connect to to the invisible. Let's put it that way. So get some strength from there. Thank you very much, Bill. And all of our, everybody that's listening. Yeah, thank you for your story. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. So, so yeah. So let's um, um, switch the mic to uh, Leia. Is it um, Leia Jean? Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Maybe you can see me. Hi. Yeah. Wow. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. yep, uh -huh. I can hear you. So, yeah, yeah I'm still very, there you are. very Hi. touched by all the things that that were said, and that resonates so much with me right now, and and also different things because the story that I'm going to share is from a very different time that or a different place that I'm in right now. But sharing that story brings up that feeling in my body again so it's very intense like I can feel already like the the excitement and um, yeah my body reacts very strongly to um, that memory so just let me breathe for a second mm -hmm. before I start um, So the story is four years ago um, when it was like three days into the first wave of the revolution here in Egypt. And the government had just shut down all the internet connections, the mobile connections. There was no way for people to communicate um, and to know what was happening at the other end of the city. And um, that was quite scary. And then at night we had a curfew from actually from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. the next day. So there was also no possibility to like walk around and go to see other people or communicate in, in other ways, except if you were already on Tahrir Square and then like people would stay there. But everyone else outside the square had to stay home um, and was not allowed to to walk around and people had also um, bought lots of stocks of food because shop like the the food supply was um, cut because there were some some roads were closed so we couldn't um, um, buy uh, certain types of food. Um, anyway, so in that moment or in that time. There was a lot of collective enthusiasm about what was happening, but also a lot of collective fear around. That was very, very impressive. Um, and I didn't know what my role was. Like, should I engage? Should we go down to the square every day like other people did or not? And 
my husband and I would like go down in the morning and then come back before curfew. And I was like this, um, yeah, blaming him for not being revolutionary enough and, you know, we should do something and like this is something big happening. We wouldn't call it the revolution yet because we didn't know that, like, you know, we talk about it now as the revolution, but back then we didn't really know what was going on, right? Um, so anyway, so I find myself at night um, alone in the building because um, my husband would go down with the other guys to protect the, um, the district, like in all the districts around, uh, like we found out later that all around in all the different districts, they would do that. So little groups of guys would gather in the neighborhoods to protect the neighborhoods because lots of people had left to stay on Tahrir Square. So there were lots of sacks also going around and um, robbing shops and some buildings and there were lots of things happening. So the guys would protect the neighborhood. They would do little fires at the corner of the streets. And then they had a whole system of communication because there was no internet, no mobile phone. And also like running around in the street was not allowed. So they used the microphones of the mosque. It was like a really great idea to use them to communicate because there's a mosque in every block, right? Or even two or three sometimes. So, so they would like communicate the different messages and get the people together if there was anything happening. And um, anyway, so but the women would stay at home and I was alone in the building because the foreign neighbors had left the country and the women had left to stay with their parents or with their family and the guys were outside so it was really scary and I didn't know what to do I was like I need to do something you know there's something happening and all these people on the head and I would watch TV and see the news and there was all this excitement and I'm, I'm not doing anything and I need to do something and I didn't know what and I was like I didn't have my mindfulness practice that I have right now to you know breathe and um, I was just running around and then in this very um yeah scary place um i find myself suddenly without thinking um i find myself in the kitchen and starting to bake a cake um i was so like overloaded with um all these emotions and the fear and the anger also for having to stay at home and you know this cliche of the woman stays at home and the guys are doing the revolution and so, but then I find myself in the kitchen and I start um, baking this cake and suddenly I feel like really through this experience of baking the cake um, without thinking, I reconnect to my body and the smell and the touch of the, and the, yeah, I don't know, it made me feel calm and, and safe for a very brief moment, which I hadn't felt for, for some days, um, yeah, because we wouldn't sleep at all also and we would like, there was no, no break or no space for breathing at that time, or at least I couldn't. So, and then I start laughing when I put it in the oven, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? You know, there's like, I don't know, a million people on Tahrir Square and doing a revolution and I'm alone at home baking a cake. That's crazy. Um, that sounded a bit like, yeah, surreal, you know. But at the same time, it felt good. I felt like, you know, some, it felt safe and, and comfortable and I felt happy also about the, the nice cake I, I made and then, and I hadn't even thought like why I was doing the cake. So, but then of course, when it was ready, I was like, oh, I'm gonna bring it down to the guys um, that were like, I was lucky because our building was on the corner. So the fire was the group of guys for our street were just under my building. So I could, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to, to bring it to them. But then I, so I went down and I, I go down and I share the cake with them and, and it was just this moment of, you know, 
I don't know how it's called, but like like this relief and this kind of small moment of of feeling home and celebrating somehow. Um, that was very beautiful. And then I look around and I start laughing again because I discovered that another neighbor's wife had made some little beautiful cookies and had brought them down too, or the guy went up and, and got them. And um, that was crazy because like, we didn't know each other and um, she was from, from another building. And at that moment we didn't meet but I felt I kind of, yeah, um, the only connect, like we felt like we were connected and we had the same, same urge of, or same, I don't know what that was that brought us to do something nice and something to share and something beautiful um, um, that, yeah, if I thought about it, I would have said like, you know, that's nonsense. You know, you're in the middle of a revolution. Why would you make a cake? And even food supply is not is cut and you don't know what you're going to eat next week. Maybe it's, you know, and then you make a cake. It's kind of, if you think about it, it's a bit crazy, but that moment was very, very intense somehow. And I didn't feel that lonely anymore, even if I didn't see that woman, because I, I felt like, the guys are connected through what they're doing, but we were connected through our intention or whatever it was that brought us together in that moment. And yeah, as I wrote in my in my story, I don't know if this cake made a difference in history, but it did make a difference in ours in our moment of history, definitely. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And and I. I thought it was relevant to to Adriana's question just because for you in that moment listening to the call you baked a cake and you shared it and who knows you know how that like you said who knows how that changes history maybe it does maybe it doesn't but but it kind of spreads um love and connection and community onto the foundation. And maybe the next revolution will have more love in it because of that experience of, of being cared for. Um, and I guess like what it says to me is we don't know what the most useful thing we could do. We can't figure out what the most useful thing we could do at any moment is, but we don't have to. Now, can I say something too, Charles? Yeah. <clears throat> I'd love to um, to comment because uh, I love this story. And um, <clears throat> I was looking over a couple of my notes, and one of the notes that I made to myself about this conversation had to do with um, what I wrote down was feeding the spirits. Mm -hmm. And having carried mm -hmm. out this earth treasure vase practice for so long, one of the big components is making offerings. And what you did was you made an offering. You, you fed the spirit. You fed the spirit in the revolution. Um, you, you fed the spirit of each of the people who ate that cake, who was playing a role. You nourished yourself and others. And that is so important. And you, you did it as a selfless, you know, act. It was spontaneous. It wasn't thought mm -hmm. out. It was just what arose spontaneously to do. And in mm -hmm. that doing, you, you experienced something that was so meaningful that here we are, you know, talking about it today. And one of the things that I was going to say about making offerings or feeding the spirit is to nourish that space in between the stories. So when we make an offering, it's like we're, we're feeding something unseen that is that place of prayer, that is um, a place where something new can happen. And 
in indigenous cultures in old old tradition you know you wouldn't you wouldn't not do that it's part of how we live our lives to to make offerings to feed the spirits to connect with with our place and with nature in such a way that we are in relationship to each other and this is a way of forming a relationship to to nature, to the earth, to to the spirit world that is um, you know, been so lost. So I feel like what your story um, it, it brings all this out, and it's mm. it's so important for us to remember to do these things. We are not alone, and and it's mm. possible too to make offerings, to feed the spirits, to invite assistance. Um, This conversation, in a way, is feeding the spirit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's nourishing some part of ourselves that we're hungry for. And we need to, to keep doing that. When I, when I have my, my circles on the full moon, people bring food. We always share food afterwards. And it's a way of, of um, nourishing ourselves for what's ahead, you know. And, and there's revolutions going on. Mm. So thank any you. Rev- yeah. Every, any, any revolution mm-hmm. that I'm part of, I want it to be a revolution where there's cake. You know, <laughs> because, because, like, the revolutionaries, what kind of world are they going to create? They're going to create a world that reflects their own experience of life. And if their experience of life is one of, of you know, sharing cake, um, uh, if their experience of life has a lot of love in it, then their, the political institutions that they're going to build are going to reflect that. Like every single, every role that is played, every offering that is made shifts reality in one way or another. Um, now, right now, I, I, we, I've been wanting to give everybody a five-minute break, which we usually do, um, even though it's, it's, it's a bit late. But I still want to do that if you need to go to the bathroom and things, because um, we have lots more wonderful questions. Phil wanted to get back um, um, and finish her question on loneliness. We have some more on loneliness, and we're not going to be able to get to them all. But um, let's do take five minutes. Um, to whatever you need to do, and I will meet you all back here. And maybe Cynthia has a uh, um, a little practice for us as well. I don't know. We're we're not so into techniques and methods, are we? No, but you had an idea when we talked on the phone. So anyway, okay. we'll we'll see everybody in five minutes. Okay. Can people hear me? I'm hoping they can, but if um, we could unmute Cynthia's mic for starters, that'd be good. Just... um, Ready to get started here? <clears throat> but I just need some indication that we are live. Hi, Charles. This is Raven. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Cynthia, Hi, Raven. Did, but I'm not sure if she's back from the break just okay. yet. Okay. All right. I see. Okay. Um, well, you know, in that case, while we're waiting for Cynthia to come back, let me um, – um, Hi there. Ah, are you? Who's that? Is that Cynthia? That's Cynthia. I am Uh here. Hi. Hi. Okay. I was here, but now I'm really here. Okay. Um, So I think we're. I think we'll let. um, Yeah. The the, the, you you had had. uh, Well. Once again, I'm juggling many many things. 
So Phil had requested to follow up a little bit on her loneliness question. So let's let's do that um, and trying to keep it keep it succinct here so we can move on to some of the other questions. Um, so Phil, do you want to come back on the mic if you're still there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, yeah, I I wanted to share a little bit more about what loneliness is on a day-to-day -day basis, and I will be succinct because I know time is running out, but I didn't really cover this before. Mm -hmm. And that is when you're alone all the time, every day, day after day, you have a certain amount of inertia. And what inertia does is keeps you from really, um, you know, not only getting things done in a proactive way, but feeling alive. And that's really where I wanted to go with my post on the forum, is that when you're alone day after day, going to, you know, weddings by yourself, funerals by yourself, I've given eulogies, I've um, been birthdays, holidays. We just had Easter. I, was, I know, Charles, you've talked about your own communities sometimes, and I wanted to uh, corroborate that. I live in a neighborhood of lots of people in a college town and um, live each other. So I don't live in the country. I live next to lots of people. And Easter just came and went. No one, you know, asked me to come over. And I've been here for 18 years. And that's pretty typical. So I wanted to just support everything that you've been saying about community and how folks are hardwired to leave people who are single alone. At least that's been my experience. Um, and when you operate in a world of loneliness like this, it's very, very, very difficult. And so I wanted to share the depth of that loneliness and say that I feel growth as a human being, as a creative artist. Um, I'm into photography and writing. I feel it's been stunted. Try as I may, try as I might, it's very, very difficult to get off the dime when you don't have direct one-on-one -on -one people in your life who care about you, not paid counselors, okay? I know that there's a place for therapists. I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about therapists, please, but I'm just saying that when you don't have someone in your corner who really, really cares about you in a one-on-one, -on -one, tactile, intimate, committed, loyal relationship, like my pets do, and I, I hate to keep going back to, to animals and pets, but that's my truth, okay? When you don't have that person, it's very, very, very hard to operate in the world and to be productive and creative and happy and joyful, all that we want to be as human beings. So that's really more of what I wanted to say mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, see if you have any comments about that. Thank you for letting me come back on, Cheryl. Thank you, Thank you. I do have a comment, and maybe Cynthia does as well. Um, my comment, if you could meet your mic, we're getting feedback here. Um, my comment, yeah, we're not supposed to be alone. We're supposed to be. It's not supposed to be this way. And one of the things that our, that our culture feeds us is that if there's something, something wrong like that, it's up to you to try really hard to fix it, to try to be happy, uh, to try to make the best of it, and so on. But maybe this is one of those times where the first step is just to do exactly what you did and to say, yeah, I am just so lonely and I don't know what to do.
that's a kind of a prejudice, I think. Well, can I jump in? Mm -hmm. uh, it comes back to me uh, to this thing of asking for help. And, you know, I think we get isolated in such a way that we, we think we have to do it all ourselves. And as, as you said, Phil, that inertia that sets in, I, I really hear you about that and see that so much. Um, but it, it's like everything kind of shuts down and we forget to ask for help whether it's from our neighbor or our, our you know, someone we know or um, the invisible realms. And I think that this, this notion of subtle activism takes many different forms. And sometimes it's, it's in relationship to our own selves. And, um, and to remember that there are these um, kind of realms of being that when we invite a uh, relationship, you would be surprised at the responsiveness. I, I think of this, and my own experience has been a lot in nature. And I've done so many ceremonies with, um, you know, asking for rain, for example. And it's just amazing how, how the rain can come if we if we ask and form that relationship in in Australia the elders when a new person comes into an area they introduce you to the trees and the rocks and the landscape and really you know sort of say well this is Cynthia and she's from somewhere else and she doesn't live here and you need to get to know her and I'm telling you who she is and I'm, I'd like to introduce you because she'll be here now for a while and you know so then you have a relationship to the rocks and the and the trees and the water and suddenly the whole landscape is alive so there's that perspective but there's also the perspective of you know, if you're wanting people to care about you, who are you caring about? And that reciprocity um, that opens the door for connection. Um, we have uh, I to think start when, somewhere. I think when, when you make a prayer like that, Often what will happen is that um, the universe will offer you an opportunity that is just a little bit out of the ordinary, maybe, uh, to exercise care for somebody. Yeah. It'll be like, okay, are you sure? Well, here's a chance. Um, and when you and, and maybe it's not an opportunity you could have created yourself, but here it is, you know, it's being offered to you. And then you act on it, and then these connections grow, and, and, and the loneliness falls away. Yeah. It's not a formula, but that prayer, that ask, exercises a power. It puts something in motion. It really mm -hmm. does. It puts something in motion. And if we have too many ideas about what the response should look like or what we're, we're asking for to be a certain way, um, or if we're too distracted with our own stuff or whatever it happens to be, and we miss the moment, we miss that little responsiveness, that little synchronicity that arises like a sign or an omen to go, oh, I heard that. Okay, here. Um, if we miss that, then, then, you know, that's too bad. That's why we have to really cultivate the capacity to show up and to be present and to not have too many ideas about what, what it should look like, this, this um, communion that we're seeking. 
It's like we're making an offering of the wanting itself. Here's my wanting, you know, we hand it into greater hands. Not directly maybe asking for a certain result, but making an offering of the wanting to a wisdom that, that will meet that wanting or something even greater in ways that are past what we understand. Be surprised, you know, like open to something so radically different that you could never have imagined it. If you have too many ideas, you, you, will, you will really miss the fun. So here's a question that was sent by Jim Belcher from Florida um, that's related to this. Dear Charles and Cynthia, I have an intention, a prayer, you might say, a hope, not so much a question. All my questions seem to start with how, and the how starts a circle of serial pontifications like a dog chasing its tail. Lots of nipping, painful. I'm here to create space within myself and around me as far out as the ripples, as the ripples will carry. Space for rigorously authentic, wholehearted connection. Space for full expression of fear and sadness and joy and love. A space of deep listening and learning, of slowing down, being together, compassion for all. When I think about how, I feel helpless, without a clue. When I let the how just be, I feel the sweet emptiness and maybe its lightness, a hint of knowing we are all together in this no answer space. Sometimes I'm quite comfortable with the uncertainty, sometimes freaked out. He goes on to say, um, in, a, in another comment, the more I engage with friends and with students and colleagues in this, the more I find and suspect that how we find each other has much to do with our upbringings, our cultural conditioning, especially our childhood needs, both met and unmet, are in our coping mechanisms for those needs that went unmet. When I discover with much help antidotes to my unmet childhood needs, I seem to be finding my way to friends, family, students, and all beings. I'm also finding my way to a deeper sense of myself. And he also says, the more I engage the question, how do we find each other, the more I suspect that finding our way to each other and finding our way to all species has much to do with accepting what is, meeting others where they are, being open and honest, and being vulnerable with others. Does that bring up anything in you, Cynthia, that wants to be said? Yeah, I think that's such a great exploration. And um, <clears throat> there's that place of emptiness in between the freak out and the, and the being comfortable uh, or the, uh, the being uncomfortable in uncertainty and the freak out at, oh, my God, now what? And that place is that sweetness that, that – this gentleman is pointing to is so precious, isn't it? And and anyway, you know, what can we really be certain about? Our death. <laughs> it's probably the only thing we can really be certain about, isn't it? <laughs> so that big that incredible amount of energy that we put out for trying to figure it out, have it make sense, um, be comfortable, is, uh, is really not helping. And that, that thing of the, the dog chasing its own tail, it's, in Buddhism we talk about cyclic existence, samsara, and that, that, that way in which things just keep going around and around and around and we never get anywhere. It's just the same old story. And that is samsara or cyclic existence that we are uh, caught up in. So how do we get out of that? How do we, how do we uh, disengage or find ourselves, you know, um, in a new story, as you would say? Um, I think being comfortable in the uncertainty 
and just relaxing, learning how to relax in the face of all of that distress uh, is a real key. And that emptiness, you see, the, the word emptiness is very interesting, too, because we think that that's a very scary place because there's, there's nothing. But actually, there's everything. And emptiness in, in Buddhism really refers to being empty of a separately existing self. Mm-hmm. So when I'm identified with myself and I think that I am over here and you are over there, then, you know, that feeling of connection is completely lost, isn't it? Mm-hmm. When I drop that and I can rest in that in that what we call empty place, everything is there. And the connection between us becomes apparent. So that that sense of self-clinging, that separate self, is the real culprit. Thank you. Yeah, that's... Uh, I'm going to read one more question well actually two and the second one will lead into maybe a little practice we can do together um but i was curious what you thought of this one cynthia um i wonder how much this is from um momo from germany i wonder how much anxiety and this is in quotes anxiety depression and quote mental illness is some something that we who feel so disconnected to the old story, who feel physical and spiritual pain at the way the world is being treated, the way the culture is, I wonder if these are actually symptoms of health, of transformation into new ways of being. And if not, what could the real symptoms of health be? And then, and then she goes on to quote Krishna Murti, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Yeah. What do you th- what do you think will be the symptoms of health in the new story? Mm. I loved that um, that sharing. It's it, to me, it's absolutely true that depression and anxiety are symptoms of of uh, something that many of us feel. We're, how could we not be depressed and anxious? You know, um, of course, that is arising in epic epidemic uh, proportions. Um, and so turning that around, um, realizing that these are, these are signs and symptoms of our, of our body, of our experience speaking to us, um, sending us a message and, um, you know, this is, this is a condition that we find ourselves. Yeah, I, 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 I call depression a mutiny of the soul that says, I'm just not going to live this life. I'm go- I would rather stay in bed all day. I would rather just not participate. I would rather withdraw. I would rather spend all my time eating. I would rather spend all my time watching TV than to participate in this life that's wrong for me right now. And because our society doesn't offer space for that, we try to stay with the program. We try to motivate ourselves. We try to, to incentivize or frighten ourselves into continuing to go along with the program. We try to medicate ourselves into continuing to abide in the wrong world and the wrong life. But eventually, that soul call to transition out of that becomes unstoppable, which is why I think that there's so much suicide among people who are you know, who have gone the antidepressant route. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, it was, and, and it was like Christian Murdy said, to say that depression, this withdrawal, this rebellion against life as it is offered to us, to say that that is an illness also says that the life offered to us is right. This is how a human being should live. This is what you should care about. Everything offered to us as the normal life trajectory. The rejection of that is pathologized. So I think that, that 
depression doesn't have to be depression. Depression could be a coming inward, a stopping, a withdrawal. And if we don't fight it, then maybe it's no longer depression if we give ourselves permission to do it. And if and it's not just up to you. I mean, like I get it. You know, our society doesn't offer that offer us that space either. In another society, they might have said, "Oh, it's time for you to go on a walkabout. It's time for you to spend a year in the monastery. You know, it's time for you to do to go on a vision quest. You know, we have space for this." But our society doesn't offer that. But maybe. So another question is, what is my dream? What, what's the hidden purpose of this course? That was one of the questions. Well, that's part of it, to give ourselves permission to be in the space between stories. It's not, the course is not about how to get out of the space between stories. The course is almost a celebration of the space between stories as, as an essential part of the territory that we are going through. I want people to feel comfortable there. I want people to value it. I want people, as Bio said, to embrace the darkness, to embrace the unknown. Because what comes from that is beyond anything that I could prescribe. Even if I were, you know, a guru or something, like whatever it comes from this emptiness is beyond, I think, anybody's capacity to prescribe for your life and to say, here's what you should do next. The 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 because the emptiness, as you said, Cynthia, is everything. Like everything comes from that, and it will bring us to places that we cannot go on our own. So it's kind of paradoxical, almost. Like, what's the purpose of the course? It's there's not any. Um, you know, tangible, here is where this, you know, it's, like I said earlier, you know, and to respond, response to some of the comments, this is not a delivery vehicle for a product, for a product called transformation. This is a space. It's, a, it's, a, it's an allowing of a really precious state of being. It's a validation of that. And it's an attempt to bring, bring us into community around that, um, which has happened some in the home groups and some of the other groups that have been that our people are, are kind of creating spontaneously. Um, and that's the intention. And I, I, don't, I don't know if it's been fully realized, but I think for a lot of people it has. Has it for you? <sighs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting things out of this course that are not what I expected, uh, learnings, and not only that I didn't expect, but that are kind of even outside the realm of the things I thought might happen but didn't expect, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, and yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, you know, even at the, when I was, you know, announcing the course, like I'm kind of in a space between stories too. You know, quite like, kind of like you, Cynthia, like you, you've been trotting around the world doing this really important work for a while that, and it felt really fulfilling. And now you get a communication from your body that it's time for something to change. And, and you know, I've been dealing with, with intense fatigue, you know, and, and um, just this question that's bringing me back into the, into that prayer of how can we serve the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible? How can I, you know, and, and for me, how can I serve it? Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what, I don't know. And, and I didn't even know that it was supposed to be this course. Um, like, I've never done this before. Like, this is a, a learning for me too. And I think I will do more courses um, that might be very different from this one. Um, thank you for the question, though. Well, we're all in this together. You know, there really is no place where I leave off and you begin, or everyone else on this call. We are, we are in this together. And 
in that place of emptiness, we are intimately connected. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important, you know, this this exploration, and uh, we're conspiring. We're we're breathing together. Did, did you want to say anything about you know mental illness and depression and stuff, or should we move on to? Well. Um, Thank you for what you said. Yeah. Um, this this place of not knowing is very scary, and the place of being overwhelmed by uh, the t- dysfunction in our in our world uh, is very depressing. And I I I've thought quite a bit about Thich Nhat Han in this conversation. Um, one of my great teachers and you know he's the one who coined this term interbeing and uh actually started the um order of interbeing uh and to be a member in the order of interbeing one was asked to start a sangha so a sangha being a community of people who come together with you to practice and that seemed to me overwhelming when I was first given that assignment. Um, but it's come up a lot in the course of this this exploration. Um, the isolation and the depression that so many of us uh, live with and the way in which technology has contributed to that. We, 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 we feel connected when we're sitting here talking to each other on our computers, um, but actually we're alone in our little our little room, and um, there's that hunger for the real warm body to warm body, face to face encounter, and so I I guess I want to make a plug for um, stepping up to the plate real person to real person and inviting uh, our friends, our family, our our neighbors, um, someone standing in the line at the grocery store to come over and, and uh, you know, ring, ring a bell and listen to it together. Uh, mm-hmm. Take a breath and a little time out and maybe offer a prayer or, um, you know, go to the river mm-hmm. and sit by the stream and um you know listen to its music uh it can take a lot of different forms but something about doing that with another person or with a group of people you'd be surprised how many people need that and want that and what a service it is some people are 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 you know getting in touch with this call to be of service and you know it can be such a simple thing by just creating a space where people can come together in real time in bodies and creating that sacred space where anything is possible and so I'm many I, I think i'm just thinking like you, you make that suggestion <clears throat> and i'm imagining a lot of people and maybe myself thinking well people aren't going to say yes to that. I can't ask my neighbor. He would never say yes to that. And what would he think? And I can't just ask a random stranger and I can't. And like, there's a lot of fear dressed up in the clothing of a rational reason why it wouldn't work. Um, And I think there, and underneath the fear, there's, there's, there are wounds that want healing. But we also recognize that we're making up stories and that probably there would be a tremendous response to that for many people, especially if you don't have an agenda and you allow yourself to be a vessel and you're sincere about, we are going to listen to a bell together. We're going to listen to a river together and trust the power of that. Just like, the power of the of the cake, you know, yeah. 
um, the, the power of the bur burying the treasure, treasure, earth treasure vaults. Like, like, we can't say how this is going to alleviate anything, whether it's our own loneliness, our own lack of community. And if, and, and if we say, I'm going to do this to make community, then we're not trusting again because we don't know what's going to come of it. But that impulse, that, uh, that offering, that prayer, will bring something. It creates movement in the universe. And I'm wondering, Cynthia, if you want to, uh, do you have a bell with you? I do. Shall I ring it? I would love to. Yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah. And we can test this out. <laughs> Before I do, I want to say one other thing, which is this thing about having a teacher. Someone in the forum wrote something about this and, you know, the importance of meditation and gathering. Yeah, I was, and I, I was going to read that one. I, I have it right in front of me. It says, please speak to the importance of having a meditative practice in a sangha with a realized master which seems yeah. critical as means of transformation, yeah. So um, I think the practice is part is really important, and I think the, um, the gathering together is really important. I think the, the um, teacher part is very tricky, and that what is being called on, how we're being called upon now is uh, to find uh, each other, and that that is the teacher, and that the um, as as a matter of fact, I remember an exercise you did, Charles, once. Maybe you've done again about the guru. Um, instead of the guru, uh, the 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 guru, and the group becomes the teacher, and it's so profound when that happens and that's all we need we don't have to have or seek out some great enlightened master uh, i mean you can do that and 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 they're out there so sometimes you can find them um but actually it's becoming harder and harder to find them um and i think that's because the authentic deep um truth abiding uh wisdom is within each of us and we just need to support each other in contacting that within and amongst us and that's why the group is so important is because it supports that process for us individually and it strengthens our capacity for wisdom when we come together but we we um we don't need to uh apprentice ourselves to someone who has all the answers because we each have the answers ourselves. Thank you. So let's listen to the bell and allow that sound to connect us to our breath, which becomes a way to um, uh, focus so that the mind can, get, can have a little time out. Just rest attention on the breath and on the sound and come back to the present moment, all the thinking, all the feeling, all the everything, just let it drop. And, um, and in that brief opening uh, that we will share together, conspire together, um, allow that sense of knowing, clarity, wisdom to um, have a little space have a little time. So, you, if you're not already in a comfortable position, um, please find it. And, uh, and then maybe just close your eyes, um, letting your attention uh, come into your heart. Breathing in and breathing out feeling the sense of interbeing of our circle, how we are, we are, uh, truly we are one, and sending that love that is in, in each of our deepest heart of hearts out around the circle and receiving the love that's being sent on the breath.
Thank you, Cynthia. And thanks to thanks to that which you are a vessel for. I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling the power of that brief moment. I'd like to uh, offer a hint of the discussion prompt for the next week. But it's about before, oh, Charles. Before yes. you do, hmm. um, I'd like to just invite everyone. Uh, on the call to take one last moment and um, each in your own way to dedicate the beauty and the preciousness of what we've shared and the prayer that is in each of your hearts most deeply uh, on behalf of all beings so that our whatever goodness that we've generated here today, whatever insights may come from the space in between, whatever clarity may arise from stopping for a few moments to allow something different to happen, that it may not only benefit ourselves, but it may truly benefit the whole earth and all being. And in that way, we don't we don't grasp, we don't hold on, we offer it. That it may grow and transform in all the ways that are called for. And feed all those spirits that need feeding. And nourish all of those places within each of us that are calling to be nourished. May it be so. May it be so. So, ah. yeah, we got a baby here <laughs> coming back just in time for our closing here. Yeah. Um, so, it's okay. We just have like two more minutes, sweethearts. Yeah. So the uh, discussion prompt um, was coming from what Cynthia just said. What is this deep heart prayer, this deepest prayer? The pure intention. What is that for you? Cynthia shared the one that she carried for decades. How can we be of service? How can we, you know, how can we heal and protect? How can we be, I can't remember exactly how you put it, but how can we heal and protect this, this, this earth? And maybe you have one that you've carried for decades. That is your soul signature. Or maybe you have one that's just really alive for you now. Because, and I want to invite you to make an offering of this. Um, and maybe we'll do it in the, in the general forum. Because if we keep them short, we can read everybody's. Um, but that's what I want you to, to think about. You know, what is that? What is that prayer that you make an offering of? And there's a power in making the offering, not just in your journal, but in making the offering into the listening of other people who will resonate with it, who will, instead of saying, well, that's a bit crazy or that's idealistic or that's naive, who will just hear it and receive it to be the receiving vessel. So that's what, that's what we would like to do with this prayer. And, and Cynthia, do you have a Something to add to that. I 
think you said it. I think you said it very beautifully. And I honor the the impulse and support. I will be in support of that process for each and every one of you as this week unfolds and as that um as the response to this question is contemplated and shared, um, I'd like to offer my my support from the field uh, that uh, that may be um, realized and heard and shared and uh, brought forth at Thank the you. beginning of a of a new of a new story. Thank you, Cynthia. I think what we'll do is we'll put the prayers on a thread on the, on the main form, and then talking about them can be done in the home groups. Although that might happen on another thread too. Anyway, I'm not going to prescribe it. But um, so I guess I'm going to just in a minute turn it over to Raven um, to to for closing. Um, But I just want to, uh, um, yeah, just really thank you, Cynthia. Um, like, as I should have expected, I got so much more than I expected from, <laughs> from this. Um, and it's just great to connect with you in this way. And uh, I feel the same. I feel the same. Yeah. It's great to be with you and with everyone. And, um, yeah, let's uh, – set aside our expectations and just be present with each other. <laughs> yeah. And thank you to everybody wonderful. else for being, okay. yeah. It's just wonderful to stir the pot is what I was yes. going to say. Stir the pot and sprinkle all the ingredients and bake the cake and mm -hmm. um, see what comes. Yes. And thank you everybody for being present here with us and sharing this, this beautiful two and a half hours. Yeah. And, um, so with that, I will um, turn it over to Raven, who has maybe a few small announcements. Just just take a minute, and um, I will see you next week. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep this very brief. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that the forum and all of the videos of each session will be available um, pretty much indefinitely um, after the course is over. So there have been some questions about that. And we just wanted to make that clear that the forum will stay open and the videos will remain available. Um, and, you know, actually, I think I'll just make that one announcement and everything else we can share via email. All right. Thank you, Raven. And goodbye, everybody. See you all next week.